So while we all went about our lives yesterday, we came very close to a catastrophic event here on planet Earth, and we didn't know about it. It turns out we just missed getting hit by an asteroid. A piece of solid rock, roughly the size of a 10-story building. Now, I say just missed because it came within 45,000 miles of us. That's a lot closer than the moon is, and scientists say way too close for something that big. Had it struck, again, they, the people who tell us about these things, say the impact could have had the force of a thousand Hiroshima-strength atomic bombs over a huge area of the Earth. There are quite a few theories about how the world might end. Uh, for example, it's been suggested that there could be a big solar storm which would take the world out. Well, we get solar storms from time to time, um, and they're a bit troublesome if you're an astronaut. Indeed, not good news if you're an astronaut. But down here on Earth, we are protected by the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the magnetic field. And OK, solar storms can disturb that. They can produce currents in power lines that sometimes cause trouble. Um, they can take out satellites stop satellites working. So they could affect our GPS and any telephone calls that go by satellite, for example. But they're not going to end the world. Every so often, asteroids do hit the Earth. We know, we can see some of the craters. There's Meteor Crater, or Barringer Crater, as it's properly called, in Arizona. And there's traces of a very big crater, partly on the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula and partly under the sea. That big crater was the result of an impact about 65 million years ago. And it's thought that's what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and many other things. So a big thing like that could cause us some problems. Broadly speaking, what happens is when something big like that impacts, it not only makes a crater, it kicks up a whole lot of dust into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere cuts out the sunlight, and that stops crops growing and foods fail and there's starvation and so on. So that is something we need to look out for, and we are looking out for. There's an array of telescopes all around the world monitoring the sky night after night, uh, actually monitoring about a thousand potentially hazardous objects, things that might come and hit the Earth one day. As they monitor them, they discover that the vast majority of them won't, that as they get the orbit more accurately, they see it'll miss the Earth. But if there was something coming to hit the Earth, we'd get two or three years' notice. And even with today's technology, we could divert it so that it didn't impact the Earth. And there's research going on all the time which will improve that technology so that it gets easier to divert an incoming asteroid. We've got no knowledge of any big asteroid coming to hit us. Some of the techniques they use to deflect an asteroid, um, one of them is to paint it white all over, which means it reflects sunlight very well. And the sunlight bouncing off the asteroid will push it sideways so that it'll move away and not hit the Earth. That's one of the neatest solutions. But they're also developing what they call gravity tractors, satellites that are pretty heavy and through their own gravity can attract the asteroid and make it change course. And there's also some that will actually physically hook onto the asteroid and tug it aside. So there's lots of ways of doing this. The magnetic field of the Earth, the thing that makes your compass point due north, that f flips over every so often. And I'm using flip as a geologist would use flip. The flip actually takes 5,000 years. Rice planting on a test basis has begun in a village near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. This comes after the central government lifted its ban on entering Kawauchi village in April. Rice planting in the area had been banned at all paddies following the nuclear accident last March. The purpose of this year's harvest is to verify the product's safety. On Sunday, about 40 farmers and volunteers began planting rice at 30 rice paddies. Fabric that absorbs radioactivity was laid near entrances of irrigation channels. 
villagers have also sowed into the soil substances that absorb radioactivity. Once the safety of this year's harvest is confirmed, rice production will be fully resumed for the next season. I'm very happy to be planting rice along with so many others. I hope the safety of the rice will be confirmed so that the village can fully begin producing rice next year. From Plato's Republic was the idea that population should be controlled and unwanted life should be disposed of like trash. In other words, that some were worthy of life and others weren't. This is a concept that comes through in Darwin's ideas about survival of the fittest. If we are evolving towards individual perfection by natural means, that would mean that collectively we are in fact evolving towards a utopian society of perfect men and women. However, in that case, those with perceived poor genetic material would be slowing that collective evolution, and so the whole process could be accelerated by getting rid of those who are not made of the right stuff. The end goal of a utopian society of purebred humans would justify the means of getting rid of the lesser ones. Remember that the full title of Origin of Species was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. One of the major influences on Darwin was a man called Thomas Malthus, who received the blessings of French deist Jean-Jacques Rousseau and famous Scottish philosopher David Hume. Incidentally, David Hume has a prominent statue on Edinburgh's Royal Mile, and if you look at the back of it, you will see this sun god symbol. Now, Thomas Malthus authored a document called The Essay on the Principle of Population, where he concluded that, amongst other things, society should adopt policies that prevent the human population from growing disproportionately larger than the food supply. Malthus, again finding a route in Plato's Republic, proposed genocide to make sure this didn't happen. Specifically, he thought to target the poor. He says, Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses and court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlement in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and those benevolent but much mistaken men who have thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Malthus believed that by such methods, the undesirables in society could be effectively culled. He said regarding children, We are bound in justice and honour formally to disclaim the right of the poor to support. To this end, I should propose a regulation be made declaring that no child born should ever be entitled to parish assistance. The illegitimate infant is comparatively speaking of little value to society, as others will immediately supply its place. All children beyond what would be required to keep up the population to this desired level must necessarily perish, unless room be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. The logic behind the idea that those who serve society least should be destroyed was echoed under Darwinism in the survival of the fittest. The individual is lost in the collective. Again, the end of a utopian society justifies the means of killing the poor and the weak. This naturally leads to another idea put forward by Plato that people who are perceived to have pure genetic materials should be encouraged to breed amongst themselves to produce a ra more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable. In other words, trying to artificially speed the upward course that evolutionists thought we were naturally already on. In truth, selective breeding had been practiced for some time amongst the elite. Inbreeding was commonplace amongst the ruling class to protect the genetic purity of their future stock. Galton merely took this idea and popularized it as a legitimate science. This very same tradition was in fact practiced by Charles Darwin himself in the hopes of maintaining a genetic superiority in his own bloodline. Darwin married the youngest granddaughter of his maternal father. Researcher Ian Taylor reveals the outcome of this project. Darwin's idea of inbreeding to produce superior stock can be seen to be a complete disaster in the case of his own ten children. Of the ten, one girl Mary died shortly after birth. 
Another girl, Anne, died at the age of 10 years. His eldest daughter, Henrietta, had a serious and prolonged breakdown at 15 in 1859. Three of his six sons suffered such frequent illness that Darwin regarded them as semi-invalids, while his last son, Charles Jr., was born mentally retarded and died in 1858, 19 months after his birth. Science has shown that inbreeding actually leads to speedier destruction of the genetic code rather than evolution because of something called biological mutations, which is why so-called purebred dogs are in fact more prone to health problems than mixes. The errors in their genetic code multiply as they are bred amongst themselves over long periods. But where true science fails, the religion of scientism continues stubbornly on. If they had followed God's wisdom in Leviticus 18, they would have heeded the warning not to commit incest and they would have been all the better for it. In their own human wisdom, however, they persisted and reaped the consequences. The idea of eugenics continued to be promoted in the scientific community for a long time afterwards. At the turn of the 20th century in 1901, the Statistics Department of London's University College became the headquarters for the Eugenics Education Society. Motivated by Galton's vision of a future utopia, ruled by a genetically engineered pure elite, the Eugenic Society grew into a successful political movement and would eventually inspire Hitler's Holocaust against the Jews. Population control is still a big issue for the elite today. As recently as May 24, 2009, the Times reported of a secret meeting of billionaires held in New York City, including the likes of Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey, where the number one issue on the agenda was how to cap the global... washing up and as it washes up it's bringing all these jelly things what is that it's all over state warns on EMP there's no help coming oh this was interesting Washington Arizona Governor Jan Brewer has signed legislation to require the State's Department of Emergency and Military Affairs to prepare materials outlining what citizens need to know to deal with either a natural or man-made electromagnetic pulse event that could knock out the vulnerable electric, electrical grid system over a wide geographical region but if this isn't another red alert for you I don't know what else to tell you the legislation SB 1476 was introduced by Senator David Farnsworth uh, it includes the type and quantity of food water and medical supplies that each person should stockpile in case an EMP occurs over the US what the legislation, however, doesn't require actual hardening of the grid within the state. Unreal. And, uh, Russia sanctions, I almost read the NBA bans, Russia sanctions not tough enough yet, analysts say. Well, if they get any quote-unquote tougher, they're going to be really attacking Putin, and that's just going to make him mad. I mean, it's not doing anything. It's actually creating another financial system. To fall back on when this one collapses. So, do you believe in global warming? Uh, yes, I do. Global warming is a bad way to phrase it. Do I believe in climate change? Yes. Yeah, to an extent, I do. Yes. 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 Why do you believe global warming? Um, because there is scientifically valid proof that global warming exists. Because uh, have a an effect on the planet that has been observed through scientific reasoning. 
being just been proven. Like scientific evidence shows that global warming is real. So plenty of studies that indicate over the last 30 years what the shit's going on if we're not too careful. Like, no, we're gonna ruin our Earth. Yeah. It's self-evident. The ice is melting. We're all doomed. We're all gonna die. I really don't know what's going on with the government. I know there are tons of weather machines. I know all the weather isn't real weather, so it's kind of like, who knows, you know? Right. One minute it's snowing, one minute it's raining, then it's hot and it's cold, so you just roll with it. Yeah, climate change or global warming, uh, yeah, I'm barely certain that it's, you know, created by uh, the activities of humans. <laughs> Do you have any ideas of how we can make fix it? Eat the rich. That's all. That's all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Here's why some believe a pole shift, a serious one, a complete one, may be on the near horizon. On December 29, 2003, NASA released this article about our migrating pole. The bottom location, 1831, in approximately 70 years it moved up one notch to 1904. Approximately 70 years later, up in 1972, it moved considerably more. And it moved about that same distance in 29 years, well less than half the time. Now the magnetic north was measured in 2005 at 82.7 degrees north, 114.4 degrees west. Now each block here is 5 by 5 degrees, so it would be about uh, here where the cursor is. A later study revealed that the pole is trekking towards Russia at about 40 miles per year, but not there yet. And that's all we know. Russia and Europe got tossed this winter. The USA had a light go of it. But the North Pole has not been measured in Russia. And if you happen to know otherwise for a fact, please send a link. Let's be clear. The increasingly fleet-footed North Pole may change direction, stop entirely, speed up, or something else. This may never be anything to worry about. And then again, a complete magnetic reversal could happen this century. Or this year. If you read these articles, you will see that the pole is not going at a constant speed. Take that into your considerations. Be safe, everyone. In 812, when the fourth angel blew his trumpet, one third of the sun, one third of the moon, and one third of the stars were struck, so that one third of them turned dark. One third of the day was kept from shining, and also the night. I believe this judgment may be declaring a shift in the axis of the earth. This would cause a third of the day to be lost as the earth starts to revolve around a new axis, which would alter the orbit of the sun, moon, stars and planets. And the sun would rise and set in a different place. And the moon would also appear to have altered its orbit. A shift in the axis of the earth could indeed cause a third of the day and night to be lost. And instead of a 24-hour day, we would experience a 16-hour day. If the Earth loses eight hours, then sunset would occur at about 10 o'clock in the morning, which means all the clocks in the world would have to be reset. God has done things like this before. In 2 Kings 20 verse 8, God made the sun go backwards and then forward again, which would mean that the Earth's rotation would have rolled back and then forward again. And during the days of Joshua in Joshua 10 verse 12, God made the sun and moon stand still for a while. Which means that both the earth and the moon's revolution stopped altogether. The technology does exist. Uh, it, it is real as you or me. And, and it's a whole lot more out there than even the most diehard believers could, could possibly fathom. The, the truth is that we, and by we I mean this planet and the people of this planet, are in essence blind to what is really going on in the cosmos and interstellar space. What people call aliens, uh, we call IBs, or, or in layman's terms, interdimensional beings. And what we found out, and have known about since the early 70s, is that, in simplest terms, other dimensions or planes, as we call them, exist and lay on top of each other, almost stacked, as if you had a blanket with another blanket stacked on top of it and another blanket stacked on top of it. To explain it so you can understand, you can imagine the Earth and our reality as a thin blanket, 
and all of these other higher dimensions are the blankets laying directly on top of ours. However, we can only see our own blanket. Now the alien beings, or the ships that we have seen in videos, and that many people have, have captured over the years, are in fact what we call jumpers in that they exist in their relative dimensions but have in fact jumped into ours. Uh, we have discovered that most of the time we are unable to see them as they are at a wavelength uh, indifferent to our own and our senses, eyes, and ears cannot detect. Um, from the information that I have gathered and been briefed on Every planet, star, and galaxy within our own plane and universe, as we see it, exists also in these other dimensions. Uh, we've detected that we know of and that I've been briefed on at least four other dimensions that do exist. Now, as I said, every planet we know of, every galaxy, does exist in these other dimensions. However, with each new dimension, each planet, galaxy, star takes on a different form. Uh, to explain it in the most simple, simplest terms, you can look at our own planet, Jupiter, which is in the outer reaches of our solar system. Now to us, it, it, it's a deadly gaseous planet, completely uninhabitable. However, when you look at Jupiter in an elevated dimension, you will see that it is completely changed in all forms. You will see that it's no longer a deadly ball of gas, but is now solid, has a different color, and is now inhabited. We know for a fact this is true due to the fact that the government has the technology to detect these higher dimensions and actually get a small view of what the solar system looks like on the other side, as we call it, in these other dimensions. There is much we do not know about the universe and how it works. However, here are the facts that I can confirm as truth and were made known to me and that I and the other people that I worked with have been briefed on. Now, we are not alone in the universe. Uh, there are alien beings within our own dimension of space as well as other dimensions. The planet Earth is an early stage, I guess you could say training ground if you will, where by which we as beings will live until we advanced to the higher dimensions. Now we are not the bottom of the food chain and, and we have discovered that there are at least two dimensions below our own plane. Uh, but that, that is as far as I will go regarding that. Now, I, I'm getting a little bit low on time, so I, I will leave you with a few other important things that people will no doubt want to know about later in time once this video is made public. Now, these are things that I have been briefed on by my superiors and that are common knowledge in the Black Ops community. Now, the planet that we know of as Mars was at one time inhabited, uh, but again, at one time, was wiped out by the people who inhabited the planet, which were much more technologically advanced than we are, uh, which we, we discovered by testing and analyzing the chemical residue uh, found from the blasts around the planet. Uh, as well as artifacts that we've also discovered on the planet, including the infamous glass tubes seen in the few of the publicly made photographs from NASA. Uh, now, these are not glass structures, but a glass-like material that is about a thousand times stronger than any material or steel that we have on our own planet. Uh, these tubes were used as a means of travel uh, underground and above ground by the people who inhabited this planet. Uh, it is thought from our research that there are still uh, uh, an ET presence inhabiting Mars, uh, but uh, again, this is, this is as far as I will go uh, and that I was briefed on regarding that matter.
Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be completely vague, but I am trying to give you a picture of, of what is going on out there that that doesn't completely put me in, in more danger than I am already in just by revealing the few things that I have. Uh, one of the last things that I will reveal, uh, and that is definitely a fact, and that I have been briefed on, and that many other people involved with the Black Op community have been briefed on, and that is our own moon, uh, which does in fact have alien bases on it, and also has bases from our own government. Uh, now, there is an ET presence, which is primarily located on the dark side of the moon. The Apollo program was in all actuality a reconnaissance mission, so that we could research what was exactly there and who. Uh, you will notice that many of the photos from the Apollo missions uh, have airbrushed out buildings and bases, and this is the truth of the matter. Uh, about half of the video that, that you will see that is document, documented from the Apollo missions uh, was in fact shot here on Earth at Area 51. In fact, if you look at satellite imagery, you can actually see what's left of a crater field uh, created at Area 51 that was used in the filming. Now, the, the, the truth is that most of the footage from the moon was simply cluttered with bases, with alien buildings, and from what one astronaut said, and I'm quoting, uh, what were constant a constant presence of alien vehicles flying over the surface, uh, cluttering up the footage. So again, they showed the American people what they could and recreated the rest uh, here on Earth that they couldn't show. Uh, from what we know, the dark side of the moon is where most of the alien presence is located. Uh, it, it's, it's a more primitive alien race from what we can see and our research tells us. Um, it's, it's more primitive than the alien beings you would see on higher dimensions, but still thousands if not millions of years ahead of us. Uh, now we have our own bases uh, which are primarily located in or near the Sea of Tranquility, which is the site of Apollo 11, and also one base that I know of located near the crater Sabine D. Uh, to this day, we are still sending secret missions to and from the moon. Uh, however, I do not know the complete details of what we are doing. The war is being waged that you may know nothing about. The war against the homeless. On April 18th, the ACLU sent a letter to both the Department of Justice and the Detroit Police Department urging that the practice of dumping the homeless be stopped. A year-long ACLU investigation claims the following. Detroit police officers stopped people perceived to be homeless in the tourist area of Greektown in Detroit. They forced them into vans, took them for a ride, and deserted them miles away. The sad truth, Detroit isn't the only city that treats the homeless this way. Joining me now from Detroit is Michael Steinberg, legal director of the ACLU of Michigan. Nice to have you, Michael. Thank you, Melissa. So tell me, what did your investigation show that the police were doing to folks who are experiencing homelessness in Detroit? Essentially what the police were doing were kidnapping individuals off the streets of tourist friendly areas of Detroit, putting them in handcuffs, uh, throwing them in the back of a wagon or a police car, and transporting them either outside the city or to deserted parts of the city and abandoning them. They then tell the individuals that they weren't welcome back into Greektown or other tourist-friendly areas. Uh, sometimes they'd make it difficult for them to return by making them throw their money down a storm drain. And the problem, of course, is that the lifeline uh, for many of these individuals uh, is in Greektown. There mm -hmm. are warming centers, there's food and churches and other services. So they'd have to walk sometimes through the middle of Michigan winter. Um, one person had a blood clot in mm. his leg and it took him over three hours to get back. Michael, I want to take a moment and listen to some of the men talking about their own experiences and then I'll, I'll have you respond to something. Okay. Did not ask what we were? You know, get in the van. I asked him if I was free to go. He told me no. 
You took like maybe a, a 15 minute ride. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're ending up. Maybe when you get there, you're uh, you're abused in some way. Um, what would that feel like? And we're walking back. It took us almost five hours to get back walking. It was cold. So, Michael, have the, have the Detroit Police Department or the Department of Justice addressed these concerns? Well, we had the quickest response time in Detroit by the police uh, in <laughs> history, I think. As soon as we sent our letter, um, they sent over two members of internal affairs uh, mm. saying they wanted to investigate it. Um, they've met with some of the individuals that we've spoken to, and we hope it will put an end to it. Um, we've also reported it to the Department of Justice because we believe that the practice violates the consent judgment that was entered into between the DOJ and the Detroit Police Department. So, Michael, part of um, what we've been talking about this morning is criminalizing drugs. But there's also this kind of impact of criminalizing homelessness. And, and we were looking at not only in Detroit, but sort of all over the country, municipalities doing things like making it illegal to, to sleep or sit um, on, in a store or in personal buildings, um, laws punishing people for begging or panhandling, uh, enforcement of these so-called quality of life or ordinances. Um, tell me, is there a war on the homeless? Uh, society, if, if we want to stop seeing homeless people on the streets, we have a society has have to treat the problem as a social problem, mm -hmm. not a criminal justice problem. Uh, we have to provide mental health services to those who need it. We have to provide uh, drug treatment mm -hmm. programs for those who need it in public housing. We can't yeah. make it uh, a crime to be homeless. It's not, homelessness is not going to go away yeah. by making it a, a illegal. Michael Steinberg in Detroit, I, I so appreciate that point and it, it dovetails so nicely with what we're talking about in, in terms of drugs. We have, a, we have a set of social responsibilities, epidemiological problems here. It is not solved through criminalizing. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Since the 2012 rejection of mass ascension, humans have embraced the fear vibration. This created the threefold return, or three scenarios that are a direct result from people's unconscious choices. One or all of these scenarios will occur. Humanity still can change the outcome, but it is very unlikely now. Well, the question was, if Iran were to launch a nuclear attack on Israel, what would our response be? And I want the Iranians to know that if I'm the president, we will attack Iran. And I want them to understand that, because it does mean that they have to look very carefully uh, at uh, their society, because whatever stage of development they might be in their nuclear weapons program in the next 10 years, during which they might foolishly consider launching an attack on Israel, we would be able to totally obliterate them. That's a terrible thing to say, but those people who run Iran need to understand that because that perhaps will deter them from doing something that would be reckless, foolish, and tragic. Scenario 1, World War III. Hillary Clinton is quite possibly the most corrupt and evil person to ever run for President of the United States. Previous title holders were Lyndon B. Johnston, the man that quarterbacked the JFK assassination, and Dick Cheney, the man that quarterbacked 9-11. But these guys look like Boy Scouts compared to what Hillary has in mind. Anyway, if Hillary gets elected, then she will start World War III, no question about it. The system of bankers and global interests she works for want World War III. War is a banker's dream. They make a lot of money no matter who wins. These people are hardcore psychopaths. They have no empathy for any other human except their own family and even then some of them get killed if they don't play ball. Read my second book for the whole story and it will shock you. They want a war with Russia and China and for the last 12 months they have been doing everything they can to provoke those countries. They need Russia or China to shoot first. That way they can justify a world war and the sheeple will support it. 
But if those countries won't come to the party, they have armed and trained North Korea with a nuclear weapon as Plan B. If Russia or China don't fire first, they will get North Korea to do it in a false flag nuclear attack or maybe a dirty bomb attack on a major US city. They hope that the loss of hundreds of thousands of American lives will spur that nation and its allies into full-blown world war. Again, as I point out in my second book, they want to fulfill the playbook of their guru, Albert Pike, who was a 33-degree Freemason, a Satanist and founding member of the Ku Klux Klan. Pike spoke how they will create three world wars. The first and second were exactly as he said that they would be, so there is no reason to doubt that the third will follow his game plan. After 10 years or so of this total world war, the people will grow weary. So when that time comes, the New World Order people will hold secret meetings with their enemy, China. They will promise China a backdoor deal to end the war. But to do so, China must stab their ally Russia in the back. In exchange, there will be an armistice. China will be given complete control of the Asia-Pacific, including Australia, Japan and New Zealand. Russia will be obliterated, fulfilling Nathan Rothschild's wish. The New World Order will control the rest of the world. All countries will live under a communist regime most resembling neo-feudalism. That is, a world of the very wealthy and the very poor, no middle class. The only reason why this has not already happened is because of one man, Vladimir Putin. Regardless of what you think you know about Putin, he is humanity's only hope of avoiding World War III and defeating the Illuminati New World Order. That is why the mainstream media are demonizing him. Trust me, when the media turn on someone, it is usually to turn public opinion against them because that person represents a threat to the establishment. Now, here is the big curveball. Mr. Obama does not want to give up his cushy life in the White House. So he may use a false flag or the upcoming Earth changes to suspend the elections indefinitely. So chances are there will not even be an election in 2016 and Obama will be America's last president and that is not set in stone just yet. But for the record, Obama is a card-carrying, die-in-the-wall communist. He honestly believes he would make a great, benevolent dictator. Read the book Animal Farm to see how that works out. Scenario 2. Islamic Caliphate On the 13th of May 1981, there was an assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II in St. Peter's Square at Vatican City. The Pope was shot and wounded by a Turkish hitman, Mehmet Ali Akkar. The Pope was struck four times and suffered severe blood loss. Akkar was apprehended immediately and later sentenced to life in prison by an Italian court. The Pope later forgave him for the assassination attempt. He was pardoned then by President Carlo Ciampi at the Pope's request and was deported to Turkey in June 2000. Akka published his autobiography in Italy in 2013. His book is called I Was Promised Paradise. He claims that he worked for an Islamic black magic cult. The Grey Wolves invoke jinns, otherwise known as demons. That group has since morphed into ISIS. They have a prophecy that their messiah, the Mahdi, will bring about the destruction of the West and Christianity. In fact, Adkar says in his book, basically, it's really as if the world finishes in favor of a new era. Going to any mosque around the world, listen to what they say about the return of the Mahdi. They all say the same thing. 
Soon, very soon indeed, he is arriving. What does this mean? That a part of Islam is sharpening their weapons. The return of the Mahdi will bring bloodshed. If the Mahdi will not manifest himself, their will will materialize him. And in short, the Islamic fundamentalist will set fire to the whole Western world. So basically, this band of evil men hope to use black magic to invoke a powerful dark entity that they call the Mahdi. On the date 13 May 2017, the Islamists plan to unleash hell onto the Western world. That is why they have been slowly positioning their people into every Western country on the planet. The refugee crisis in Europe is the last stage of positioning the chess pieces. It is their specific intention to destroy the Vatican in Rome. Pope John Paul II strongly believed that this was the third prophecy of Fatima. The prophecy of Fatima was given to the world on May 13, 1917. The first two prophecies were released almost immediately. However, the third prophecy was supposed to be released to the world in the 1960s, but for some reason it was kept sealed. On May 13, 1981, on the anniversary of the original prophecy of Fatima, Pope John Paul II was en route to St. Peter's Square to deliver the third and final prophecy. He was adamant that the people deserved to know what it contained. Before he could reveal the prophecy, however, he was shot down by Mayamet Ali Atka. The Grey Wolves, now ISIS, did not want their plans revealed to the world. The third prophecy of Fatima contains their plans to destroy the Vatican and the Western world, and they want to do it on a special date of May 13, 2017. Many of the Vatican Cardinals have secretly converted to Islam in hope to save their skins when the time of destruction comes. They want to be part of the New World Order One religion. A new Vatican II is under construction. It is called the Temple of the Work of the Holy Spirit and it is located in Palestrina just outside Rome of the Serpent, which I talk about in Book One, connected to the priest class that became the Illuminati. This new temple is supposed to be for the One World Religion and will begin after the destruction of the Vatican. Notice how the inside looks like a mosque where followers kneel on their mats to worship. Construction is expected to be completed in 2019. Scenario 3 the return of Nibiru. I cover everything you need to know about Nibiru and its inhabitants in my first book, The Truth Chronicles, Book 1, Secrets of the Soul. However, here is a quick background. There is a planet that the ancients called Nibiru. NASA calls it Planet X. It's about 4.5 to 5 times the size of Earth. It belongs to a small solar system whose star is a dwarf star known as Nemesis. All up, the Nemesis system has seven planets and Nibiru is its largest and is the only one that's inhabited by beings called the Anunnaki. It has a dusty red atmosphere that creates wings on each side, so the ancients always depicted Nibiru as a winged disk. Nibiru passes the Earth around every 3,500 years or so. Sometimes it comes close and sometimes it comes really close. The last time it came really close, it stripped the atmosphere of Mars, sending all of the Martian oceans into space. The Anunnaki that were based there had to evacuate and come to Earth. On Earth, it caused the Antarctic ice sheet in the south to break off causing a global tsunami that the Bible refers to as the Flood of Noah. This flood and ensuing cataclysm was documented by dozens of native peoples all over the world. The Anunnaki monitored this whole episode from a satellite they put into orbit. This satellite is still in orbit and is now known 
as the Black Knight satellite. As Nibiru approaches Earth, the gravitational forces begin to make their presence known. The much stronger gravity of Nibiru begins to heat up the Earth's core. Between the Earth's core and the outer layer, known as the crust, is an area called the mantle. The mantle is the most solid bulk of Earth's interior. It lies between Earth's dense superheated core and its thin outer layer, the crust. The mantle is about 2,900 kilometers or 1,802 miles thick and makes up a whopping 84% of the Earth's total volume. As Nibiru approaches, the mantle becomes superheated. This increases its viscosity until it becomes liquefied. As this happens, more and more volcanoes begin to become active. Earthquakes start to happen everywhere. Coral in the oceans becomes bleached and the weather patterns become severe. The countdown has begun. Overnight, blizzard-like conditions in Massachusetts. Nearly 1,900 crew working through the night, clearing roads. Treacherous conditions leading to wreck after wreck. In upstate New York, a bus carrying three dozen college students flipping over and winding up upside down. Incredibly, there were no serious injuries. And in Connecticut, a tractor trailer sliding and jackknifing on this bridge. New Jersey police releasing this dramatic dash cam video. Trees snapping from heavy winds. In northern Pakistan, flash floods triggered by heavy rain have killed at least 55 people. An emergency operation has been launched to help thousands of survivors, dozens of whom have been cut off by a landslide in a mountain valley. Some 150 homes are said to have been destroyed.
These earth changes are what I was told about 20 years ago, and they are happening right now. In April 2016, there were daily events for the whole month. These included volcanoes erupting, and even some that have not been active for over 70 years. Earthquakes shook many countries, wild weather was everywhere, it even snowed in Saudi Arabia. And of course, scientists revealed that 90% of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia is now bleached, exactly as I spoke about 20 years ago. Back then, I correctly predicted that the signs would become more obvious after 2012, leading up to 2020. But I must admit now that it appears I got that timing slightly wrong. I now have good evidence that it will come much earlier than 2020. Earthquakes, volcanoes and wild weather will only get worse as Nibiru approaches. However, the real showstopper comes next. Meteorites. Nibiru passes through the Kuiper Belt, which is made up of billions of asteroids and chunks of ice. Some of these objects are as large as Pluto, while others are only the size of a pea. It will also pass through the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. As Nibiru passes through the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt, it drags millions of rocks and debris with it, trailing millions of kilometres behind it. As it approaches the Earth, many of the asteroids will be pulled toward the Earth due to gravity. So as a final sign of Nibiru's approach, we will witness mass meteorite showers. However, some of these meteors can weigh as much as 30 kilograms or 65 pounds of solid iron. So when they fall from space and hit the ground, they will explode. It would be like being in the middle of a World War I artillery barrage. There could be as much as one month of these meteor showers, but they will vary in intensity and in size and duration. Some days will be worse than others. A CIA insider has come forward and revealed that they have been tracking the Nemesis system since the They now know it will swing by very, very close to Earth this time, within about 50 million kilometres. Now, that's like a stone's throw in astrological terms. This is going to cause a pole shift. Remember how we said the mantle will heat up and become liquid? This will cause the outer crust of the Earth to slip. As Nibiru passes at its closest point, the Earth crust will slip in the direction of Nibiru's gravitational pull. Thus, we can expect the slip will be from the South Pole to the North Pole. So all the land mass of Earth will move at about 1,400 kilometers per second, or 0.86 miles per second, south to north, then abruptly stop. The sudden stop will cause all of the oceans to slosh up, then go back in the opposite direction they came from. That will create a global tsunami of about 700 metres to 3,000 metres high, or 2,296 feet to 9,850 feet high, travelling at 700 metres, or half a mile a second. The water will slosh back and forth for several days. In fact, as Nibiru passes, it will stop the Earth's rotation. So one side of the Earth will be in complete darkness for three days, and the other side will be in complete sunlight for three days. As Nibiru passes, the Earth will begin to rotate again as per normal. Basically, the Earth is going through a very rare process that will see most of the inhabitants of the planet die as a result of massive earth changes. It is not the first time this has happened, and it will not be the last. The ancients knew that and they tried to warn us. That is why they built their monuments in massive stone blocks. 
The reason why so many will die is because they do not want to know. They do not want to listen. They do not want to be part of one of the most exciting times in this planet's history, the Ascension. Humans were given a choice and they chose fear. We all live in a kleptocracy now. It is a term applied to a government that is in bed with the ruling class, in this case corporations, taking advantage of corruption to extend their personal wealth and political power. Corporate lawyers now write all of our legislation. They write the laws to benefit the corporations, protect them from prosecution, and maximize the ability to make a profit, even at the expense of the people and the environment. This is the world we live in, and most people are happy to turn a blind eye. That is how they got into control in the first place. The world is now so far gone down the corruption path, the self-entitlement mentality path, the selfishness path, the apathy path, and the willful ignorance path, that there is no way to bring it back. But not everyone on earth will die. Indeed, for those that do want to know, that do want to listen, that do want to participate, then welcome aboard and keep watching. What the Palladians were telling me that night was like myself, many others were being asked to not only preserve life, but to build a new way of life and to get the message out to as many people as possible. By following their instructions, I could be assured that the second vision, that of happy people in the hills, would be a reality, your reality, and that of anyone else that cares to join in.